Tickets. Tickets, please. Step inside, take a ride, upon the terror train. All aboard, be fair warned, these rails house fear and pain. Find a seat, don't mind the heat, just pray the lights stay on. Upon these rails, these bloody rails, in darkness lies no dawn. Yes, step inside, come crawl or glide. With us, you shall remain. Upon this ride, this hellish ride, we call the Terror Train. Take it, please. <laughs> James Ward Kirk Publications presents Terror Train Episode 116 Nevada. Welcome aboard. Welcome to my home. I am the disembodied voice, your ghost host, so to speak. Call me Terror. <laughs> Welcome to my train. Be you dead, undead, or of the living.
the velvety tones of Colobo Nima by Shane Koch. Michael watched Lindsay sleep. Satisfactorily spent, he'd just explored every inch of her with sweaty abandon. She was only wearing panties, curled up on the shelf-like bunk in their compartment. Her blonde hair splayed out in a fan, and her magic curves cooled in the shadows. His eyes poured over her. He would want her again soon. And she would want him. The newlyweds couldn't keep away from each other for long. He'd just given her some medicine, and she would be out for a while. His new wife was rather high maintenance, but he loved her, so there it was. With the way the world was, Lindsay just needed to be out sometimes, and he could understand that. He could just hear her breathing over the vibrating white noise of the train, the muted rumbling of the straining rails. As he dressed, his eyes continued to find the small, round, reinforced window in their compartment. The upper Nevada vistas lumbered by slowly as the armored train moved west. Inky black clouds tumbled through the red skies in the distance. Were they heading this way? The black masses stabbed at the desert with bolts of orange and blue lightning as they rolled on across the sky. It would have been a beautiful sight, save what the clouds represented, and what came with them. The things darted around the lightning, gliding and diving, their burning ember eyes, and he shivered. The bastards. Michael pulled on a plain white t-shirt and tucked it into his jeans. He jammed his pistol in his waistband. He leaned in close to Lindsay, turning her sleeping face to his, and had a long, deep taste of her strawberry mouth. He left her there to her fevered dreams, exited their compartment, and aimed himself towards the dining car. He left the locked door of his compartment behind and walked past a series of small windows in the cramped passage that led to the rear cars. Flashes of the horrible, beautiful lightning flashed in his peripheral vision as he approached the heavily armed guard at the end of the tiny hallway. Michael nodded at the man and left the first-class car through the heavy, sliding metal doors that led to the rest of the train. The first thing that hit him was the smell of the refugees that filled the second-class car. Families were huddled in piles, murmuring to each other, sleeping, crying, or praying. Some stared hopelessly out the windows, their dirty faces shaded the color of blood. Michael stepped gingerly but briskly over and around the frightened, hungry people, avoiding eye contact and dodging filthy children. He noticed the telltale signs of the upturned faces, the virus lesions. Black, veiny streaks tracked on their skin, evidences of the new diseases the things brought with them, the endless sickness. They could not afford the vaccinations, and Michael could almost feel the resentment at showing his healthy face among the stricken poor. Whoever thought it was a good idea to put the dining car toward the rear of the train should most certainly lose employment. He suspected it was on purpose. People with money were on the same level as the things in the eyes of the unwashed. One of the guards, this one in riot gear, kept the people begging at the door of the dining car at bay with the butt of his assault rifle. Michael pushed his way through the angry throng, showing his first class pass, and entered the dining car. It was relatively crowded in the dining car, too. But at least it was a better stripe of people. No disease, and only mild hopelessness. 
he made his way to the back, looking for a seat. He found one at the table of an old couple who were facing the back of the car. Michael walked around and smiled at them. The old man looked like a stereotypical professor with wire-rimmed glasses and a tweed coat. His wife looked rather serene, probably from the drugs. She was holding a Scottish terrier on her lap. Of course she was, and she was feeding the dog scraps from her plate. Is this taken? Michael asked with his smile, motioning at the empty chair. No, no, please, the old man said amiably. Have a seat. Michael sat and motioned for the waiter. Thanks, he said to the old man. No worries, the old man smiled. We're all in this together, yes? Looks like it, Michael said as the waiter approached. Could I please have some kind of meat, chicken or beef, and a beer? The waiter nodded and walked off to wherever the food was. Nice to have money, the old man said, conspiratorially. Don't you think? It is. My wife and I had to buy our way out of Boston. With Reginald, of course. The old man motioned at the dog. We're headed to Oregon. Have some friends there. We heard it's not so bad on the West Coast. Is that right? Hmm, the old man said, through a mouthful of fish. His wife, with her absent face, continued to feed the dog off her plate, as if by reflex. Where are you headed? the old man asked. Northern California. The old man continued to talk while he ate, but Michael let his mind wander, only keeping enough attention to acknowledge his companion's words. The windows were much larger in the dining car, and Michael felt a little exposed. The red world outside sped by, and he figured that the windows were plexiglass, or that new trans-steel stuff. The people in the car went about their business slowly, probably not wanting to run the gauntlet of sick and praying poor back to first class. He would relax for a bit, but he could not, did not, want to leave Lindsay alone for long. Who knew how much time they had left? And he needed to be with her as much as he could, to see her sweet eyes gazing at him, to love her as she deserved. Michael noticed a couple sitting near the other end of the car. He'd passed them on the way in, but he didn't register them. Now that he looked closer, he saw that they were not a couple, but a father and daughter. What struck him was the unearthly beauty of the girl. He had real eyes for no one but Lindsay, but he appreciated this black-haired girl, probably seventeen or eighteen, on a purely aesthetic level. She was like a living work of art, her perfect face sorrowful as she talked softly to her father. Something had happened to them, but then what hasn't happened to almost everybody? The girl was one of those unattainable visions, a pedestal girl, and whatever man she settled for would forever walk in her beautiful wake. A shadow hit the window next to the girl with a thump and stuck there. Everyone jumped and watched to see what new horror had arrived. It was a black, hairy mass, fine fur blowing in the wind, and you could only see the lower body of the thing stretched across the glass. Something slithered from the fur, a wet blue tentacle, and it smeared snail-like on the window. It got bigger and harder, and Michael realized that it was a monster's dick. The blue engorged cock rubbed on the window, and he, like everyone else, watched in fascination and revulsion. Then it came, spurt after spurt of black jism, spraying the window in sloppy globs. In the quiet, there was only the rumbling of the tracks 
and the short panicked breaths of the passengers. Then there was a sizzling, hissing sound. The window was melting. The thing swung its legs and burst through. The girl and her father were thrown out of the way by the exploding squares of melted safety glass. Then there was that moment, that beat you had to take to absorb the horrible things that rained from the black clouds, the crawling and screaming creatures that were slowly filling the world. It was a reality readjustment, a reboot, a moment, just one, an instant for your brain to catch up with your eyes. Only then did the screaming start. The black furred thing stood as tall as a grizzly bear, with stubbly clawed arms and legs to match. Its head nearly touched the ceiling, but it was a head that was not possible. Little blue tentacles danced up from the neck like waggling fingers, a writhing nest tickling a weightless, bobbling void, a basketball-sized orb of blackness in which stars twinkled. There was an aura of white light coming from the perfectly round head, a sickly halo of gleaming, muted glow. There were two red eyes floating like binary stars in the black void, and a mouth looking superimposed like a bad special effect hung below them, sharp toothed in the nothingness. The thing reared back, its huge blue cock standing erect and bloated, demanding terrified attention. Michael thought that the creature was going to roar, but the creature did not roar. It sang. Kolobomima. The thing warbled, and it was the most wonderful sound Michael had ever heard in his entire life. It was a syrupy whale song, a mockingbird repertoire in slow motion sound, tuning forks on the rim of crystal glasses. It was none of those things at all, but it was everything. It was the sound that was missing, the song you always wanted to hear, but didn't know it. The buzzing wave hit Michael's brain, and he was drunk with it. He thought he might just sit for a while and enjoy the sweet sound. Nothing else mattered. Another beautiful wail came from the creature. Kolobonima. Was that its name? Or was it his? Was he that? Saucer waves of light exploded from Nima's impossible head, blowing Saturn-like rings that passed through everyone to share joy and love. Twinkling bubbles of stirring sound popped, ephemeral and transcendent, lifting Michael's heart to a golden ring of God's bells, Colobo Nima's bells. As everyone watched, Nima grabbed the black-haired girl, the perfect one, the lucky one. He mounted her on the floor, hovering over her like a giant. She had a dreamy look on her beautiful face as Nima positioned himself, his fabulous dick searching and probing. Michael could almost hear her moan in anticipation. She flipped her lustrous black hair and beamed at the creature over her shoulder as she raised her ass up and arched her back for him. She gave Nima that unmistakable, full speed ahead look and go for it smile. Kolonima, the creature sang, and everything was fine. That delicious-looking giant blue cock ripped through the seat of the girl's jeans, and Nima fucked her. Fucked her good. The girl's eyes widened, and her head snapped back, so that she was almost gazing at the ceiling of the car. Her lips parted, in a harsh gasp, and the muscles in her neck stood out and strained. Michael crammed his head for a better view 
around the old man and his wife, watching the show with a clinical detachment. The blue thrust had turned red, plumbing the girl's blood, and Michael realized matter-of-factly that the gorgeous cock was way too big for a human. The creature was tearing the girl in two. The song came again, a ghostly brush feathering souls, and Michael wished it was him getting it from Nima, not that goddamn girl. The music and the fucking slithered through his brain. But something was interrupting the beautiful music. A sound, an annoying insect of a clamor, was interfering with Nima's loving noise. The girl was screaming. Bitch! Didn't! She didn't! Michael looked again, closer. He narrowed his eyes and blinked away floaters. Not only had Nima fucked a new hole in the backside of the girl, he'd come. The girl, filled with acid, a toxic spew that ate through her stomach, splattering her smoking, burnt insides on the dining car floor in a gush of sizzling splash. It was... awful. Michael shook his head. He was watching a girl get raped to death by a monster, and it was okay by him. Had he been enjoying it? The girl's screams were bringing others around as well. People started getting up and grabbing their weapons. By the time the dead girl had stopped screaming, everyone with a gun opened fire. Laughter, like the twinkling sound a snowflake might make as it tumbled down from the heavens, lashed harmoniously from Nima's floating mouth. The black void of his head and his furry body swallowed bullets. The black-haired girl's father screamed with rage and ran at Nima, who was still beautifully laughing as he fucked the girl's melting corpse. Nima, in one smooth motion, snatched one of the girl's arms off, ripping it free from her shoulder, and he smacked the father across the face with it. Michael could hear the snap of the father's neck, even from where he was sitting. He reached for his pistol. Michael, stuck in his seat, shook the cobwebs of Nima's songs from his mind. He made eye contact with the old man he'd been sitting with. The old man looked confused and panicked. He drew a pistol, shot his wife in the head, shot the dog, and then ate a bullet himself. Michael blinked in surprise. He picked the old man's pistol from his twitching fingers and held it, along with his weapon, in both his hands. He was on his feet, unsure of what to do. Colobo Nima stood then, allowing what was left of the girl to slide off his still ready cock. Acid burned meat and intestines smoked and dripped from the blue erection. He was getting ready to sing again as he shrugged off bullets, rearing back for a large burst of intoxicating, blissful tone. His head, a hideous mirror of space, began to pulse. Nima's awful stars shone, and his red eyes burned. His call was coming. Michael thought of Lindsay. He did not want to hear Nima's song again, because he had to get to Lindsay one last time before everything was over. He held the old man's pistol next to his left ear and fired, the bullet splintering the wood behind his head. His ear exploded with a horrible ringing, indeterminable and unforgiving. He swooned on his feet, pain shooting through his skull. He immediately fired the pistol next to his right ear. He fell to his knees and dropped the guns, holding his hands over his ears. The ringing. It ripped his mind in two. But then, Lindsay. Her eyes. Her smile. He struggled to raise his head, hands still cupping his ears. Nima sang, the brilliant light show broke from his star-filled face like spinning pinwheels 
and searchlight flashes. Another burst, an aria of rainbow lashes, whipping and licking, fireworks and drifting flower petals. Michael saw this wonderful, horrible show of savage light, but he was unaffected by it, save a visual amazement. All he heard was the painful ringing, and he was thankful for it. Others in the car were not so lucky. Passengers dropped their weapons and came to Nima, mesmerized by his deadly call. Person after person offered themselves up to the monster. Michael watched in horror as poor bastard after poor bastard was splattered by claw or sprayed by acid sperm. They were lined up, waiting their turn, and all their faces showed was awe and appreciation. Several men and women knelt before Nima, working his massive cock with love and a whimpering, needy lust. Their hands and mouths worshipped and slopped in a tender, communal, tearful, and happy oral masterpiece. They were rewarded with a surging deluge of acid ejaculate that ripped through their surprised faces and burned through their quivering bodies to the floor. Those he must have considered unfuckable, Nima simply eviscerated with horrendous speed and power. Getting anywhere near Kolobo Nima was like standing next to an angry hand grenade that exploded forever. The guns were worthless, so Michael left them as he struggled up to shaky footing. He just needed to get past Nima. Just get by the creature, that's all. He carefully hefted the bloody corpse of the terrier from the old woman's lap. The bullet from his owner made what was left of the dog look like an open-faced sandwich. He rushed toward Nima, behind the waning number of passengers lined up for destruction. When he was close enough, he pushed several men and women into the monster, momentarily staggering it. Then he threw the red, dripping sponge of dog. The bloody, splayed body of the terrier splatted against Nima's black head and stuck there. The gore glob gummed up Nima's starry face. The monster stepped back for a second, surprised. Michael slid and tripped over a heap of melting, ruined corpses as he dashed by, the soles of his shoes smoking from the acid slime. He reached the door that led to second class and slid it open. The armed guard was there, had been watching through the tiny porthole, and Michael chanced one glance back while he pushed past the man. Nima's head was in flames. The dog burnt to a crisp and fluttered away in ash, and angry tendrils of light and sparks jumped and curled like miniature solar flares. The eyes and black space were framed in fire, and the sharp teeth snapped in the floating mouth. Nima glared at Michael and sang hard, sang mean. He could not hear it, but Michael watched the guard instantly take his helmet off and rip out his own eyes. The monster was singing a song of pure death and destruction, and it was coming. Michael elbowed his way into second class, Nima behind him, the song of hate bellowing. Michael just made it past the refugees as they heard the evil music. The poor people walked toward the monster, ripping out their eyes, tearing at their throats, breaking their children's necks, offering themselves up to Nima on an impromptu altar of self-destruction. The first class door slid open, and Michael looked back again. Nima was like a whirling engine of carnage, his massive cock limp, only angry, only after Michael. The monster's claws reduced every refugee to a gore explosion that painted the walls chunky red. Spurting heads and limbs tumbled through the air as Nima tore his way through the wall of tender flesh that kept him from the one human who was ignoring his terrible song. 
Michael pushed past the last guard, who was reaching for his eyes, and made it back to his compartment. He locked the door. He had just enough time. He reached for his drug case and found the wake-up hypo. He gave her the shot in the thigh. He watched Lindsay jolt awake. She sat bolt upright, her blonde hair twirling, and her eyes found his. He should have left her asleep, but he knew she would not have wanted him to do that. She wanted them to be together at the end. He could feel the vibrations of Nima's massive footfalls in the hall. It's over, he said, but could not hear himself say it. She looked at him with love and sadness. Her lips said, I love you. Then she seemed to be listening to something. The song. Michael grabbed another hypo. The last one. Michael was holding Lindsay in his arms tightly, and he could feel her scream. He prevented her self-mutilation for the second it took him to give her the dose. And she was gone. Colobo Nima tore through the compartment door, and his ursine form paused a moment before the kill. The massive blue cock was hard and ready, dripping in anticipation. Black arcs of death song swirled around his head, an ebony blossom with ember eyes. Michael sneered at that evil starlight face, those red eyes, and he dosed himself. Then there was nothing. And the train rolled on towards the red horizon.
Psycho Train by Roger Cowan Under the grinning moon of lunatic skies, the devil's train creeps along the abandoned tracks, keeping to its preternatural route through desolate towns forgotten by the modern world, across the savage countryside where hulking amorphous beasts lurk beneath the surface of stagnant lakes, and winged reptilian horrors soar through charcoal black skies. Eldritch beings stagger around ancient stones in a profane dance to their dead gods, inviting their unholy masters to their obscene feast. Here, through these wasted lands where madness reigns, the devil's train rolls along a malevolent fairy between the living world and the dead. Yes, our guests have taken their permanent seats from New York to time and infinity. Are you ready to join them? Hmm. Perhaps another story will lure you. Choose a car, any car, for the time we had a permanent guest. They tell their tales of horror at its best. Come, yes, join me. My name is Terror, who rides the rail. Survived this trek? No turning back. Dare resist, just try. Step back inside, we'll be your guide. So many ways to die. Upon this ride, nowhere to hide. With us, you shall remain. Upon this ride, this hellish ride, we call the Terror.
Terror Train Podcast, Episode 116, Nevada. Produced by Krista Clark Grabowski, David Schutz II, and Mary Genevieve Fortier. Podcast directed and arranged by David Schutz II. The Conductor, Your Narrator, was created by and played by David Schutz II. Terror, The Disembodied Voice, was created by and played by Mary Genevieve Fortier. Terror Train Podcast Opening and Closing Poems, written by Mary Genevieve Fortier. Host Segment Dialogue for Terror, The Disembodied Voice, written by Mary Genevieve Fortier. Production Music, The House of Leaves, Chase Pulse, The Hive, and The Voices, by Kevin McLeod, Incompetech.com. Featured Works, The Velvety Tones of Kalabonima, written by Shane Koch. Production Music, Clean Soul, Veins, Thunder Dreams, Unease, Medusa, Nervous, Red Letter, Bump in the Night, and Controlled Chaos, by Kevin McLeod, Incompetech.com. Psycho Train, written by Roger Cowan. Production Music, Grave Blow, and Digital Bark, by Kevin McLeod, Incompetech.com. Additional Sound Effects, by AudioSoundClips.com. Podcast Program Edited, by David Schutz II. The stories and poems presented in the Terror Train podcasts are all featured in the James Ward Kirk Publishing Anthology, Terror Train, which was edited by Krista Clark Grabowski and A. Henry Keene. Cover art by Stephen Cooney. Content copyright 2014. Terror Train. Podcast episode 116. Nevada. Copyright 2014.